There's been a discussion recently about the ethics of trickshotting, which, while it's blown over and tweets have been deleted, brought up some thoughts I'd like to share about the often fraught relationship between casual and competitive players. I won't get into the specifics of the argument that started this, because I cannot stress this enough, I do not care about the specifics of this argument. But for the sake of this video, we'll boil down what they were saying to this. There's an idea that we should take it easy on newer players, still beat them, but maybe not as badly, so that we don't overwhelm them early on, and they're more likely to stick around and become a part of the community that way. This means we don't flex on them, we hold back a little bit in fights to give them a little more time to figure out their mechanics, maybe even let them splat us a few times instead of going for a 40 second KO, and then we tell them, GG, you did great, keep it up, in the text chat after the match. There's another idea, that we should play exactly the way we usually would, because coddling players will give them weaker mindsets going forward, and the ones who are going to stick around are already tough enough to be able to take it, and would actually prefer that you not hold back against them. As with many polarized arguments like this, both groups are wrong. Differently wrong, with some valid points that combined with the other side's valid points could lead us closer to the truth, but still quite wrong. I've been seeing this argument crop up since 2006. But wait, gems, Splatoon didn't exist until 2015. I'm talking about Super Smash Bros. Melee, my first competitive game, and a game whose competitive community has a pretty major impact on the Splatoon community. Really, I'm actually talking about the legacy of the traditional fighting game community, which has a heavy influence on the Melee community, but also has a somewhat different culture. I promise we'll bring this back to, to squids in the modern day, but sometimes you gotta talk about Aristotle to get the context for something that actually got written in English. Fighting games got really popular in the days where video games were played in arcades. The way those games were designed, if you put your quarter in and beat your opponent, you got to stay on your side of the machine to play the next player in line. Winner stays, loser pays. Players who got good enough to run the machine, that is, beat everyone so they got to keep playing, were heavily incentivized to do so because they could get a very long session for just the price of a quarter. Beating the opponent was the only way you got to keep playing the game, so people didn't expect anyone to go easy on their opponents in that setting. However, everyone was clustered around the machine watching, and since you're going to have to beat the nerd who's managed to stay on the machine, you're going to have some time to theorycraft, talk to other people waiting in line, ask the better players questions, and learn how to have the best shot to beat them. Players who wanted to learn the game were inevitably going to lose, and lose a lot. The choice before them was either develop thick skin and an improvement-focused learning mindset, or leave and not be a part of that community. The players who stuck around and earned their stripes, the ones who got good, had a lot to be proud of, and received a lot of praise for sticking it out. That sort of resilience, the ability to problem solve and adapt instead of getting frustrated, is a downright noble characteristic for a human being to have, and fighting game players prided themselves both on their development of it, and on convincing others to develop it themselves as they joined the community. This very specific, socioeconomically defined culture that developed around games like the Street Fighters and Mortal Kombats has had an impact on gaming culture in general that goes beyond those circumstances. Even once fighting games could actually be played on consoles, the people who were best at them were still the players who had done their time at the arcade cabinets, and they took their mindsets with them even as the landscape of the industry changed and you didn't need quarters for it anymore. Someone thinking along the lines of an old-school fighting game player, or consequently an old-school melee player, would say that we should never take it easy on an opponent, because then the opponent has less they can learn, and that, if anything, it's disrespectful to do so. They would say that not taking it easy on anyone creates a culture where the people who stick around are better able to adapt and learn, and that they'll be stronger players in the long run because of it. Now, on one hand, I do have to agree that, as a competitive player, I want the top players that I play against not to go easy on me, because if something I do against a top player who's trying their best works, I know it works. If something I do works against a top player who's not trying their hardest and maybe sandbagging a little bit, I don't know if that thing works, and that gives me misinformation. So I believe that their idea about this is true but misleading. See, the catch is the phrase, the people who stick around. It's a culture where the people who stick around 
are better able to adapt and learn, and that they'll be stronger players in the long run. The fighting game community, for as long as it's been around, for as many powerful narratives drive it, and for as dedicated as its scene is, is very small compared to communities for other esports. It's totally valid for players to just decide competitive play is not what they thought it would be and that they're not interested. But there are also things that people with the traditional fighting game community mindset do that are responsible for some of it. As a Melee tournament organizer, I realized, through having to interact with each individual person who wanted to sign up for a tournament, that there are routinely a bunch of new players who go to exactly one tournament and then never come back. The number of people who are interested in competitive games enough to actually try something like a tournament is staggeringly huge compared to the number of people who stick around long enough to make it their main social circle and attend regularly. Part of their problem is something the Splatoon community actually does much better, that is, a sense of diversity and inclusion. The game-changing arcade fighting games came out in the 90s, back when scenes like this... You play ball like a girl! were normal. Old Melee players will remember some language that we're definitely better off for having left in the past, uh, names of some old Mango Combo videos for example. There's also just the issues that the games themselves have a high barrier to entry, like you have to make how many inputs to throw one fireball, your character has how many moves they need to memorize, but it's more than just those kinds of issues. It's easy for an experienced fighting game player to see someone new walk in the door and get excited and want to start explaining everything to them. They want to bring them up to speed, to be helpful to them so they want to stay, to have more people to play your favorite game with, to get them to the part of the community that you love, which is learning to be a better person through playing your favorite video game. And look, I've been there too. I still remember a girl from my university who showed up to the Smash Weekly I ran, and how I sat there with her for 45 minutes explaining the movement techniques she'd want to learn on the character she was using, and how she never came back or responded to any invitations to play at any other gatherings. That was me. And while it's hypocritical, this many years later, I, when I see someone doing the same thing, I want to shake them by the shoulders. My brother in Smash. They have been here for 22 minutes. You're telling them that you expect them in the near future to commit themselves not only to learning one of the more technically challenging video games they will ever play at a competitive level, but also to improve their very outlook on life. It has taken you a year and a half to learn what you already know, and you are still very much in the process of learning it. Calm down. They don't need to know everything right away. Let them be curious, and let that curiosity bring them back. Any tournament organizer, or even player who's invested in the community, owes it to themselves to try and understand the mindset of these one-time players, because even if we snag one out of every 50 of these players and they become regulars, we're accomplishing something that will grow, strengthen, and prolong the community. People will eventually stop playing a competitive game. And when they do, if no one new is joining, the community will end. This experience shaped the way I view building a community. Your value to your community is defined by the number of people you bring into the community minus the number of people you drive away from it. So it's good to be proud of the progress you've made and the more adaptable skilled player that you've become. But as soon as you use that progress to deliberately humiliate someone by beating them with an overly complicated suboptimal combo and laugh at them in front of others in the group, you're decreasing your value to that group, even as the players around you laugh and cheer for what you've managed to do to that player. Sure, it's one thing to have that kind of banter going back and forth between friends. That's all fun and games. That's Zero and Kyo yelling at each other. That's Wombo Combo. That's Yipes commentary. That's two experienced players building a friendly rivalry. But if that player is brand new and they haven't decided to stay yet, they may not be comfortable with that. It's not on you if they lose. But if they don't come back because of the way you made them feel for losing, that is on you. It's not that you should never perform that combo or put it in your YouTube videos. What I'm saying is that you should frame the combo differently. It shouldn't be, watch me destroy these kids. You should learn this game so you can be an alpha male lone wolf super gamer and flex on the kids who play it like I do. It should be, 
Look at how creative this game is that I have so many options to express myself through my play. Look at how cool my character is. Look at how much skill expression there is in this game. As soon as you make the game about dominating someone else instead of about learning and growing together, 50% of all players at any given point in time must feel bad for the other half to be able to enjoy themselves. That's not a way to build a healthy growing community. Now, in response to these concerns about the culture of old-school gaming communities, there's been a lot of pushback. And like I alluded to earlier, a lot of that pushback is good. Removing certain words from our vocabulary on commentary is a very beneficial thing for us to do. Making the space more available and less hostile towards women, you know, that slight majority of the human population, those people who also have brains and thumbs and can play video games, yeah, you know the ones. It's been a wonderful trend to watch. But making competitive gaming less combative, less confrontational, less about get good, does tend to get twisted and oversimplified and in some specific ways let some pretty unhelpful wimpy mindsets exist without being challenged as much. Being more inclusive means that a lot of the time we're not going to insist that people pull themselves up by their bootstraps because we recognize there are plenty of factors besides laziness or negativity that could be holding them back, and we can't always know when those kinds of issues might be at play. But we need to make sure that we're not just giving up on trying to combat laziness and negativity. If we lose any ability to criticize someone because of our overabundance of care for their emotional response to criticism, it's easy for bad mindsets to flourish. To be clear, just because I know someone who hasn't been listening well is going to think I'm making some veiled political dog whistle, inclusivity is not the problem. Like I've said, the more people we bring into the community of whatever gender, race, age, or skill level, the better. The problem is toxic positivity and being permissive of weak mindsets and entitlement. The topic at hand is trickshotting, but since I've already sort of covered that earlier in the script, I want to address another really common casual complaint, spawn camping. Splatoon is a game where controlling more of the map than your opponents do is an advantage, and the overall strategy always boils down to being able to deny your opponents access to the objective so you're able to play that objective uncontested. In theory, spawn camping is a way to accomplish that, splatting someone as soon as they spawn so they can't access the map and you get to play the objective for free. Ironically, Turf War, a game mode played much more casually than competitively, is, in a way, the worst experience to be spawn camped in. In, say, Rainmaker, if your team is getting spawn camped, you probably have two or three seconds before the enemy team can get the Rainmaker to the goal and end the game by KO. There's a built-in mercy rule in any of the ranked modes. You don't have to keep playing the game in that frustrating lockout before the other team just wins and you each move on to the next game. But in Turf War, bad instances of these lockouts can result in a couple minutes of spawning, getting splatted, and spawning again, and the game only encourages it. The goal is to paint more of the map than the enemy team, right? Well, if we've already painted our own base, and already painted all of mid, and already painted all of the enemy side, where else are we supposed to go? Just sit in mid in the middle of a sea of our own ink for five seconds before we run into our opponents and splat them again? A lot of spawn camps that players complain about aren't actually malicious, and result more from this aspect of Turf War's game design, that there isn't anything else you can do once you've gained a certain advantage state, and the game won't end once you reach it. Now, there are occasionally some players who will spawn camp to flex, spawn camp to their own detriment, leaving the Rainmaker in mid just to play for the highest KA count they can reach by sitting in the enemy spawn. This is bad sportsmanship, and I won't defend it. But let's assume this scenario is happening to you. What I tell everyone about spawn camping is that it actually puts the spawn campers at a major disadvantage. When you spawn, you start right away back where you were before. If they were to get splatted and respawn, they'd spawn on the opposite end of the map, and at the very least they'd have to spend some extra seconds super jumping back into a teammate, who would probably still have to be at least a little further back from your spawn point for the jump to be safe. Even if you get splatted three times by the same player in your own spawn, don't give up, because as soon as you manage to splat them once, they're out of your hair. You've sent them packing. They're more removed from your spawn than they can possibly remove you. Also, most spawn areas are fairly well designed to protect you from spawn camps if you take advantage of them. They give you multiple options for how to leave the spawn, and they give you high ground the opponents can't climb for you to use defensively to force them out of hiding and start taking space back. They can't splat you if you choose not to drop down yet. 
drop bombs over ledges, paint before you drop, come out from a direction you haven't come out from before, wait for your teammates so you can drop down together. At some point, you're going to be able to catch them looking the wrong way or paint enough to force them to give you some space back. Just like squid bagging, spawn camping, even in the most disrespectful way, is something that a player with a strong mindset looks at not as an assertion that you have been dominated, but as a tactical error to punish. While I have said on record that we should, if anything, coddle new players in the competitive community if it keeps them here, I also think we as competitive players can coddle them in ways that aren't so much keeping them here, but driving them away or perpetuating mindsets that are incompatible with them being here. I see in some commentary that casters will be so relentlessly positive that they won't even point out obvious mistakes. Even when a player would certainly have said, yeah, that was a bad decision, I shouldn't have done that, it'll get a positive spin. This approach lacks genuineness. It advertises a competitive community where there are no mistakes, only happy accidents, when no, there are in fact some decisions that you can make that will cause you to lose. The beauty of competition is not that those mistakes are to be celebrated, but that we as humans are adaptable, resilient to our circumstances, that we can learn from our own mistakes. We may screw up, but our screw-ups can be learned from and avoided in the future. This sort of commentary robs the commentator of their ability to really analyze the game, and it ends up coming across not only as fake, but also nowhere near as informative as someone who's willing to talk about what should have happened instead. If encouragement we give new players comes in the form of, you're a great player, you're really talented, if you stick with it, you'll do really well, that can, to someone who hasn't struggled to build a competitive mindset before, make it sound like they are entitled to success, and underplay the amount of work that's going to have to be put into their improvement. Take a comment like this, which, of course, I'm going to keep anonymous, and I'm going to ask you to leave alone, even if you do find where it was posted. They object to super jumping out of the 1v1 because they, the opponent, want to be able to splat them? Because they enjoy the game less for not being able to gain that advantage over the other team? What about that player's teammates? I know they'd prefer the player super jump out so they can be back into the match sooner to help. That comes across as someone who feels entitled to being able to win the game. It's little kid on the playground logic, making up rules so they can win. There's a camp of seasoned competitive players who would take this comment and laugh at it and send it to the Scrub Quotes Twitter account and meme on it. And then there's a camp who would deem trickshotting unethical, who may tolerate this kind of a statement for the sake of making every player feel welcome, and the correct response is between the two extremes. While we shouldn't other this person immediately and laugh them out of the room, we also need to be willing to, politely, calmly, challenge these ideas and get people to rethink them. Parents and teachers and all sorts of other folks correct us all the time without throwing us out. It's a normal part of life for a friend, an authority figure, a colleague, even a complete stranger to look at us and say, hey, this behavior is not going to work for you here. I would just urge you to learn how to do so in a way that, while firm, doesn't alienate the person or try to blow them up in front of your friends. Sometimes it feels like the Zoomers saw Super Hot and his crew perform. I broke up with my ex-girl. Here's a number. Mm. Mm. What's that shit say? Psych! That's the wrong number! Oh! <laughs> and decided that that was just a normal way to live their lives. As an English teacher, I've had students literally jump up onto chairs or tables yelling about how I roasted a student that got a question wrong. And a lot of the time, having sat and reflected on how I corrected them, I couldn't think of a way I could have done it that much more carefully than I did. Those bystanders just wanted something to pop off about and looked so hard for it that they found it even when it wasn't there. It's like they're looking at real life as if it's reality TV, where all of the people around them are just characters for them to find funny and feel better than. There is nothing wrong with playing the game casually, nor is there anything wrong with playing the game competitively. There do tend to be problematic patterns in competitive players that drive people away from playing competitively, and there are also problematic patterns in casual players that make them resistant to learning and improving. 
Most of the time that any controversy arises over the topic of casual versus competitive play, it boils down to people with these negative attributes butting heads, never getting anywhere because both sides have some good points that anchor them and make them feel like they're right, and neither is self-critical enough to address the valid points the other side is making. Next time you feel like you're in an argument like that, stop looking for ways to show that me right, you wrong, I win. Look instead for solutions. Look for how you move forward together. Because continuing to butt heads doesn't work, and you need to find something that does work. Acknowledge valid points that they make, and then recontextualize them to show that what they know to be true isn't incompatible with your worldview. Don't raise your voice and alienate them. Bring the two of you to a place where you can coexist and work together more cooperatively than you did before. Don't try to dominate them. Problem solve with them. Because you can't just make them go away. And yes, as I'm sure some of you have already guessed, this is also dating advice.